uh, the august gathering which is here uh, all of we chemistry lovers which are here uh, whosoever is directly related to chemistry or whosoever loves chemistry is here so i welcome you uh, all of you uh, i just want to seek permission of principal sir should i start sir please start ma'am thank you sir uh, right now uh, we have participants 115 uh, participants who have joined us on zoom some participants have joined us on youtube also and they are uh, 118 on zoom and uh, participants are constantly joining so uh, we'll let them join and we'll just start with the program so thank you very much welcome uh, dr uh, bharadwaj satyamurthy from for being with here with us For on this platform, on this virtual platform, which is hosted by uh, Madhav Science PG College Ujjain. As सबसे पहले आपका स्वागत सर. जैसा we were talking that you just asked that what type of what is the flavor of the program and what type of program is this and why on this uh, on which platform we are conducting it and why do we are conducting this type of program sir. So again uh, picking up the strings from there. This is a program on NM. Uh, the, the the program this very specific program on NMR which we are conducting today is in uh, I can say that in continuation to a virtual Uh, lecture hall which we have hosted and we have uh, approximately organized 26 lectures under this virtual uh, lecture hall हमने इस लेक्चर हॉल में सर जो 26 लेक्चर्स हैं दे वर वीडियो लेक्चर्स व्हिच वर व्हिच व्हिच वर अ पार्ट ऑफ सीरीज होस्टेड बाय डॉक्टर आत्रे हनुदत एस आत्रे फ्रॉम इंडियन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ साइंस बेंगलोर सो वी वर शोइंग आवर स्टूडेंट्स दोज वीडियो लेक्चर्स एंड देन वी वर होल्डिंग डिस्कशंस अबाउट दिस एनएमआर or uh, on the basis of those video lectures nmr happens to be in the syllabus of uh, our students ye in sab ke uh, syllabus mein bhi hai pg ke syllabus mein bhi hai ug syllabus mein bhi hai and then we have research also going our college is a research center and chemistry is one of the oldest departments of this uh, college and we have a very good reputation as far as uh, uh, talking about chemistry education in general and research in specific so we have a very good reputation in that. that so our students are doing very good things we have many flagship programs and with the help of those flagship programs we are imbibing these research potentials into <clears throat> these ug and pg students so that they can go ahead and they can uh, do something for themselves and they can bring uh, laurels for the college also and i am very, very thankful nice. to the student community that they are doing so that they are just making us proud and we have a very good very fine uh, students we have with us so i welcome you all uh, students which are with us jo aaj yahan nmr sunne ke liye hain और एनएमआर से हमारा रिश्ता नाता बहुत पुराना भी है सर क्योंकि हम हर साल एनएमआर के ऊपर बिकॉज वी अंडरस्टैंड दैट एनएमआर इज अ वेरी व्हाट वी कैन से दैट इट इज अ लाइफलाइन ऑफ केमिस्ट्री रिसर्च सो एवरी ईयर वी ऑर्गेनाइज प्रोग्राम्स ऑन एनएमआर वी ऑर्गेनाइज लेक्चर्स ऑन एनएमआर एवरी ईयर वी आर डूइंग दैट एंड वी हैव इन्वाइटेड मेनी फाइन uh scientists across india from different institutes from iisc and from other institutes too sir so in that series i welcome you so first of all i would i would like to invite dr brajesh pare uh, head of the department chemistry uh, to introduce and welcome dr uh, satyamurthy bhardwaj between us welcome dr pare thank you thank very you. much uh, i'm i'm audible Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's a really very pleasant evening. We have with us uh, uh, Dr. Bharatswar uh, Satyamurthy from uh, Aizar Bhopal, uh, Honorable uh, Principal of our College, Dr. Arpan Bharatwar Sir, uh, Dr. Kalpana Singh, the IQSC Coordinator, Dr. Jeevan Singh Solanki, my colleague, and all the colleagues from the Chemistry Department and the other departments. It's really a great honor and pleasure to have. Uh, uh, Dr. Bharathwaj Satyamurthy with us today, and I, I'm sure that all of our students are really delighted. And just to, uh, for for our students, you know, we need to know about uh, a little bit of about uh, uh, Professor Bhar, uh, Bharathwaj Satyamurthy. Uh, he's from Aizar Bhopal, and in fact, you know, his field of work is uh, a solution state NMR spectroscopy, uh, with a focus on the characterizing structure and dynamics of uh, biomolecules. 
So although the title is you know, the, the basics of enema, and Professor uh, Dr. Bhatswad uh, Satyamurthy is a really an expert, so it will be a great, a great day for us to to listen to him. Uh, just a brief about him, you know, he has done his masters that is MSc from IIT uh, Chennai, and uh, then he did his PhD uh, with Professor Thomas uh, Sajdeswski, that is and from the State University of New York. USA and later on he has done his PDF uh, from two, uh, I mean, at least three uh, US universities uh, with the, the Honorable uh, Professor Hashim Hashimi. So that way, you know, he, he has got a wonderful exposure, you know, throughout his uh, educational life and, and then his PDF. I will definitely, for from uh, from the point of view of to, to encourage our students and I would like to read out uh, some of the achievements of uh, uh, Dr. Satyamurthy. And uh, he received a Distinguished Enema Service Award from State University of New York at Buffalo, Department of Chemistry in 2012. Then he was nominated for the Graduate School and the Matron Teller Teaching Assistantship Award for 2010. That is all uh, probably during when he was doing his PDF. Among top uh, 0.5 to 1%, he got in GATE and CSIR NATE in 2007. All our young students, how inspiring, see, and in 2007, he, he was uh, he was among the top, uh, you know, the 0.1% uh, percent of uh, the, the GATE and CSR students. And he was selected for the Sharma Prasad Mukherjee Fellowship for PhD interview. He was among the top 5% of the graduating masters in chemistry from IIT Madras in 2007 batch. And he received the tuition waiver for the entire duration of masters. That is really very creditable. He received the summer research fellowship in 2005 and 6, uh, Jane uh, CSR and IS, he worked in the, the uh, IICS Calcutta. And in 2005, with Professor uh, Brindaban Ranu, uh, he's a really a great scientist and chemist. Then I see Bangalore in 2006 with Professor Anil Kumar. He secured high rank in the all competitive exams for the master's program across India. Right, Jane, he ranked 17. University of Hyderabad ranked, he was second in IRC, integrated program interview call and everything. So that is an awarded gold medal. Uh, that is the K.R. Sundar Rajan Memorial Medal, then Patta Birami Reddy Medal, and then uh, so many medals definitely to his credit by the governor, Surjit Singh Barnala was given that. So this, this, this is uh, some, some of the salient country, uh, the awards he received. And that is really very encouraging for all our students. He is such a young man. He is the assistant professor in Iser Bhopal, and he is working very nicely. So then uh, he has given uh, very important uh, uh, invited talks, mostly related to NMR at various places. Then he has given, you know, in, in the resume some of the selected publications, and all the the DOI numbers are given, you know. So our students later on, if you want to see, you can just download the. Uh, the papers. So such a person, you know, he's so young, so dynamic. Uh, to have you with us today, uh, Professor Satyamuthi, uh, I, I welcome you on behalf of the Department of Chemistry, on behalf of the, the Mother Science College, and uh, we are looking forward to listen to you on, on the basics of NMR today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor, for the very uh, elaborate introduction. I didn't anticipate that, but thank you very much for the opportunity as well. No, yes, yeah. ma'am, please continue. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pare. I would just like to ask Principal Sir, because of his many uh, responsibilities which are, which are with him, so would you like to speak a few words or would you like to conclude the lecture? Principal um, Sir, I'm, Dr. Bharadwaj. Uh, yeah, ma'am. Uh, I, I feel that I must speak a few, a few things yes, here uh, before the audience and all the August gathering. I welcome uh, Dr. Bharadwaj Satyamurthy uh, to this uh, web platform. And it's really a great pleasure, as Dr. Paris said, that he, is, he has joined and a young man like, you know, it's very, very much, uh, it uh, actually you people attract, you, you know, uh, young scientists to do uh, great things because we are all people, We when we talk, we, when, we, when they look at us, they find that, uh, oh, they are too young to do something. But, uh, when they look at you, when you will be talking about NMR, they will be uh, feeling that, yes, they can also do something great. And that is what we want to make our institute uh, great through our students. So before uh, you start, I would like to say that NMR is really, a, it takes a 
a unique approach to present magnetic resonance starting from basic principles to leading spectroscopic and imaging applications in biomedical research. NMR measurements, as you said that you are expert in solution, I will like to mention that NMR measurements, solution and solid state NMR, uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, that is MRS, then magnetic resonance imaging, that is MRI, they and uh, such other techniques with biological and biomedical systems and samples are very prominent nowadays. The samples include biofluids, cells, tissues, organs, and whole body from different organisms of humans, animals, bacteria, fungi, and plants in biomedical research. It has been applied to the structure and function determination of important biological molecules as such. So uh, it's really very nice to listen to you about uh, a technique which targets drug, which study drugs and interaction of drug with the, its targets. Then it, it is used to identify abnormal metabolites in, as the biomarkers for specific diseases. It <coughs> helps, NMR helps in uh, diagnosis of uh, disorders by imaging particular tissues or organs. Then it is used in then DNA and protein structure determination, as all of us know, and it plays a very a pivotal role in uh, studying molecular dynamics, quantifying emotion, emotional properties, and uh, moreover, as all of us know, ये तो हम लोग जब बच्चे थे तब भी जब हम लोग एमएससी कर रहे थे तब भी नेचुरल प्रोडक्ट केमिस्ट्री में एनएमआर का रोल हम लोगों ने समझा है और जाना है और उसको देखा है कि कैसे नेचुरल प्रोडक्ट का आइडेंटिफिकेशन में न्यूक्लियर मैग्नेटिक रेजोनेंस स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी उपयोग बस यही कहूंगा कि आपका आना आ, हम लोगों के लिए आ, एक वरदान होगा इन बच्चों के लिए एक वरदान होगा और वो आपसे इंस्पायर होंगे और कुछ बहुत अच्छा अपने जीवन में करने के लिए होंगे दैट इज व्हाट आई एक्सपेक्ट एंड आई विश सो थैंक यू वेरी मच डॉक्टर भारद्वाज सत्यमूर्ति एंड बी इन टच विद अस भोपाल तो बहुत दूर नहीं है उज्जैन से बहुत पास में है और अभी वेन द थिंग्स वेन द सिचुएशन बिकम्स नॉर्मल यू विल बी वेरी हैप्पी टू have you in our campus to see you in our campus and sure, then we sure. really do something which is uh, uh, which is really needed for the students so i thank you once again sure i would be happy thank you dr galpan singh uh, thank you very much okay thank you principal sir now i invite dr uh, bharatwaj satyamurthy for uh, today's uh, lecture on basics of nmr spectroscopy mm -hmm. understanding molecular players of life from small to bio macro molecules welcome sir floor is all yours thank you very much ma'am before you go on mute i have a quick question for you so how much time i have i have 45 minutes to 16 minutes or yeah. what is the time for 45 minutes to 60 minutes it's okay sir we will okay. be having questions in the end students i would just request that if you have any question go on writing them will and ask the questions in the end or you can just uh, type your questions in the chat box too Thank you. Yeah. So if you want, we can also extend uh, another thing. I just saw some students raising their hand in Zoom. They have a question in the middle. If somebody raises the hand, they can also ask the question in the middle. I have no problems with it. So don't uh, feel, uh, uh, I mean, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. That might help you understand this entire lecture better. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. So let me start sharing my screen. So um, let me turn off my video because that will end up distracting. So my video comes from my laptop while I'm be, I'll be teaching from the uh, tablet that I have here. Uh, so let me make sure you're able to see. So I assume my slides are now visible. Is that right? Yeah. Perfectly, okay. sir. Perfect. Okay. Just one moment. All right. So now that is done. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, first of all, I should be thankful to the organizers for giving me this wonderful opportunity uh, being an admin of 150 students and faculty and of uh, different uh, flavors and range. Uh, I'm very happy that even in the times where we are not able to go outside and meet people, uh, we are able to keep seminars of this kind so that students and even faculty like me uh, rejuvenate ourselves by having this kind of interactions. Uh, in this talk, I'll be, it, it's a, a very broader topic, uh, but the main reason why I took it up is so that I'm able to bridge the gap between undergraduate, postgraduate, PhD students, and some faculty who might benefit from this entire talk. So this is not expected to be in very great detail, but will paint a picture of how NMR is helpful and what are the basics of NMR, what results in NMR even being a technique that's possible for us to exploit. Uh, in this aspect, I'm quite happy that uh, uh, Professor Kalpana mentioned 
that uh, Professor Anudita Atreya's uh, YouTube videos are very helpful. In fact, I'm one of his uh, juniors as well. I benefited a lot in discussing with him. Uh, it is indeed sad that last year he passed away from us, but I'm sure his lectures are going to be extremely useful for us and we'll keep benefiting from them as we go forward. Um, okay, as I've been already introduced uh, quite a bit, I come from Indian Institute of Science Education and Research, Bhopal. And uh, if you would like to ask any questions outside this forum, please feel free to email me in my email address uh, as shown here, bharatwaj.icb.ac.in. In addition, if you would like to know more about my lab, my students, and what kind of research we do, feel free to log in to bionmr.wordpress.com and uh, you would be able to find more details about what we do and who all are there in the lab. Okay, so let me get started here. Let's start with a very basic question of what is spectroscopy? I'm starting with this question largely because there are some undergraduate students where spectroscopy is not introduced in the third year of BSc. In fact, that was my uh, status when I was finishing my BSc, so I thought this would be the right starting point. The way the definition goes is that people generally try to say it is the interaction of light with matter. The light that we are talking about is something that we actually apply basically in terms of an electromagnetic radiation. And the matter that we are referring to here is most often the sample that we would like to interrogate. So therefore, what ends up happening here is that you have a system and you're trying to probe the system. And this is what is basically called spectroscopy. And the most important thing about spectroscopy is that it gives you a molecular fingerprint, meaning that if you take a given molecule, it will have very specific signatures, depending upon which spectroscopic technique that you're using to probe this. In NMR, it, you might have some overlaps, but in, case, uh, in that case, you might be able to see differences that come in IR spectroscopy or Raman and so on and so forth. There are a bunch of spectroscopy that help, to, uh, that help us to characterize a given molecule. And this is done by basically perturbing populations across non-degenerate energy levels. So what do I mean by that? Whenever you have a molecule, immediately you could imagine that there are different energy levels that are present. In terms of the UV visible spectroscopy, you're talking, uh, talking about the N to pi star uh, type of transition that ends up being uh, probe. And uh, depending upon the spectroscopy that you end up using, different energy levels are perturbed. And if you have non-degenerate energy levels, non-degenerate meaning the two energy levels have different uh, energies by themselves, then what you, end, what you could do is to apply uh, EM wave, which is the light we were talking about a moment back. And then the population that's present in a given state gets transferred to the higher energy state. And when these population relaxes back, to its ground energy state, it ends up releasing energy that you would be able to follow. So basically you have a detector, like you can imagine a camera that we end up having. And then the light source is something like, like a torch or something where you shine on it. So that is the perturbation that we are talking about, generally an electromagnetic radiation. And once this process ends up happening, you collect all the information from this detector and therefore you will be able to understand uh, what kind of molecule you have at hand. Of course, there's a lot more details that go into it. I'm skipping all that for the sake of uh, the fact that even junior students should be able to follow. So now going on to molecular spectroscopy, and I've been emphasizing quite a bit on electromagnetic radiation. I'm sure we are all aware of the fact that the EM spectrum, the electromagnetic radiation spectrum, spans a large energy range. The one that we are most familiar with are actually radio waves, which we use for FM and AM radio transmission. And also uh, recently, I'm sure all of us have thought up more on microwaves, where, which we use for heating our food. Of course, it's also used for spectroscopic ways of uh, analyzing molecules. There's also vibrational spectroscopy that benefits from IR radiation. The one that we are able to obviously see is the visible range of the electromagnetic radiation, the colors that go from violet to orange, as we're able to see, or red. Uh, then comes the ultraviolet uh, radiations, uh, which have a higher energy than that of the visible and the IR uh, rays, followed by X-ray radiations. And X-ray radiations are one of, one of the highest in energy sources, and we actually use it very sparsely, and generally we use it uh, when we use the X-ray scan. We don't go around getting X-ray scan every now and then. We do it rarely. And then for some spectroscopic techniques, even gamma rays, which are of the highest of energies, 
are also used. So basically what I'm making you understand is that the cost that I ended up drawing in the previous one, which I called as the electromagnetic radiation, could span all these energy levels, okay? And that depends upon the energy that you're supplying in, and that energy is decided by which part of the electromagnetic radiation that you are using in order to probe the sample. One important thing that one has to understand, whenever we are talking about an electro and magnetic radiation, you have two parts that go along with each other. And what you are able to see in the picture that's shown on the top right is that you have, let's say this is the electro, um, uh, electrical vector and this is the magnetic vector, the EM radiation actually inscribes a helix in three dimensions. And basically this is what ends up perturbing uh, the populations in the different energy levels that you're trying to understand. And now the important part one has to understand here is that as you keep increasing in energy, so in this case on the top, you have the units in frequency and on the bottom, you have the units in wavelength. These are all inversely related to uh, one another. I'm sure you remember E equal to H nu or E is equal to HC by lambda, where H and C are constants, uh, Planck's constant and the velocity of light. So what you are able to see here is that as you go farther and farther in this electromagnetic uh, uh, spectrum, you are actually using higher and higher energy. So what does this mean? Is that as you use more and more higher energy radiations, you could actually cause problems to the sample or the person who ends up uh, uh, using this. So uh, this is one of the important things that we have to understand. NMR ends up using, uh, started with long radio waves, but currently NMR is in the range of 10 power six to 10 power eight hertz, uh, which is in the range of say, few hundreds of uh, megahertz. So you are able to understand, first of all, NMR spectroscopy is so sought after by different scientists, chemists, biologists, uh, biophysicists, largely because this uses energy, which is of relatively lower uh, in, in its uh, magnitude. And therefore these are extremely harmless to the samples that you end up using, which is why when people end up getting an MRI scan, it actually does not affect them at all. On the other hand, when you're trying to get an X-ray scan, one has to be very careful where you should not be getting X-rays too often or uh, you end up uh, having the risk of uh, contracting other issues that come along with it. So the first thing I'd like to put out here is that since all of us listen to radios, the FM radio uh, and AM radio, and in fact, we all use, your, use our mobile phones and these all end up using radio waves. So one can immediately understand NMR radiations or the radiations that are used in NMR spectroscopy are of lower in energy that does not harm the sample or the person that ends up uh, experiencing it. Okay, the next question that comes up, all right. So now we spoke about spectrum and spectra. How do spectra look like? Almost any spectroscopy is characterized by two things. Uh, the x-axis that has the intensity and the y, uh, sorry, the y-axis that has the intensity and the x-axis that has some form of energy or the other that is being present. So before going ahead, what I'm showing you here is there are different types of spectroscopy that could interrogate. Uh, just a moment. Uh, yeah, there are different types of spectroscopy that it, uh, interrogate chemical moieties that we are looking at. Uh, let's start from something like as simple as molecule as uh, sucrose. I'm sure we all like sucrose. Uh, it's sweet and we are almost have it uh, in almost very different uh, food stuff that we eat every now and then. And what you are able to see here, sucrose is characterized by uh, C12 H22O11. Uh, and the one important aspect that you are able to see when you run a proton NMR of sucrose, you are almost able to see all the 22 resonances that are present in it. Meaning that you would be able to specifically talk about a given proton in this given spectrum. So. Basically, that gives a big power of, for NMR where you are able to get atomic resolution. Now, let's move on for the same molecule using other types of spectroscopy. I'm showing two other examples where the same sucrose molecule is actually uh, interrogated with vibration spectroscopy, such as IR and Raman spectroscopy. I'm sure you might have learned that these spectroscopies are actually complementary to one another. Whatever information you actually get from one, could be, uh, might not be available in the other and vice versa. So basically what you end up measuring in uh, vibration spectroscopy is the given bond, how uh, strong is the bond and whether you are able to characterize different bond vibrations that are present in different molecules. And as you're able to see, there are way too many resonances that are present 
which would end up showing the feature for a given bond, but different uh, types of modes of vibration, like stretching and bending. So this kind of complicates matters a bit, but of course, these are also extremely important techniques in order to study a molecule. One other example that I put here is microwave spectroscopy. Unfortunately, showing a microwave spectrum for sucrose will be very complicated and one might not be able to understand. Therefore, I'm showing a very simple molecule. In the case, I'm showing something like iodopropane. I'm sure you all know what is propane and you substitute uh, iodine in one of its position. What ends up happening? You could end up having the iodine and the methyl group in different possible conformations. Here, what you are able to see is that when propane is in staggered conformation, where the methyl and the iod uh, iod uh, iodine atom are either trans to each other or gouged to each other. And from microwave spectroscopy, you would be able to pick very specific rotational signatures for trans versus, oops, I'm sorry, uh, versus gauge conformations as well. So what you are able to realize is that although you are looking at the same molecule, spectroscopy is very different across uh, different techniques that you end up using. And one of the biggest advantages that NMR offers is that it provides you atomic resolution. And on top of it, it does not harm your sample. Uh, for that matter, even IR and Raman does not harm your sample. So it does not microwave for most of the cases. But of course, when you start complicating things with even higher energy radiations, you end up uh, uh, having a problem that maybe the molecule does get uh, getting caught up. Okay, so now that we have seen some examples of uh, different kinds of spectrum, let me quickly introduce what is spectrum and what we try to look for in a spectrum. We have already now understood that uh, uh, spectrum gives a molecular fingerprint of the substance that you're working with. The source matters. The source is what we have gotten introduced in terms of the electromagnetic radiation. And the property that you are trying to prove, for instance, if you're trying to get an atomistic characterization of how the atoms are, how the positions look and all that, then NMR is a great tool. On the other hand, if you're trying to look at whether a hydrogen bond is more stable or not, of course, NMR could also be used, but other spectroscopy such as, uh, such as IR also comes uh, into its own, uh, uh, comes with, with its own benefits. So what are the features of the spectrum that you're trying to look for? So as I said, on the x-axis, you have the intensity generally, and the, uh, sorry, the x-axis, you have the energy. And in the y-axis, you have intensity as one of the parameters that you try to look for. And generally, a spectrum uh, is of this kind, where you have an absorptive resonance that ends up coming. And it's characterized by its resonance frequency or uh, resonance wavelength. And in addition, what you also have is something called line width. Many people end up calling this as a full width, that half height or half maxima. And this also has a lot of features that go with it. And in addition, you need to have a specific amount of intensity. Intensity is given by what is the maximum maxima that you see in a given spectroscopic uh, or in a given spectrum. The signal to noise ratio is also a very, very important parameter. Although the spectrum that I'm trying to show here is ideal, meaning that there is literally no noise, when you're actually ending up measuring a spectrum, you actually have noise that corrupts this entire uh, observation that you would like to have. The signal to noise ratio is nothing but the ratio of the intensity to that of the average noise that you would end up measuring in a given spectrum. And in general, what people end up trying to say is that if you have a signal to noise ratio of three, you can adjudge that this is a resonance that you can try to interpret. If it's anywhere lower than that, it could as well be something called an artifact. Artifact means it's a fake signal, which might not actually be part of the molecule, but it's coming because of maybe an experimental imperfection or something of that sort. A lot of people also end up using the line shape. Uh, they fit the line shape to understand more information from uh, a given molecule, which I'll not be going into detail for the given moment. So I hope uh, this slide has made you understand what do we try to look for and how a spectrum helps you get a lot of different properties. Now, the first thing that we, we would have to acknowledge here is that NMR spectroscopy is dependent on the nuclear spin quantum number that is being present. For people who are aware of quantum chemistry that have been introduced in your uh, classes, you would understand that when you're trying to solve the hydrogen atom problem, one of the last steps that you encounter is the spin of an electron. The nuclear spin can exactly be thought about the same way, where it does end up behaving interestingly when you uh, put it in an external magnetic field. 
NMR is nothing but exploiting the same phenomenon, but instead of electrons, it's actually for the nuclear spins. If you exploit the spin characteristics of an electron in a uh, subtended magnetic field, then that's actually called electron paramagnetic or spin resonance, EPR or ESR. So we have already had an idea, where does this energy fall in? The energy difference is actually so less that uh, radio waves, radio frequency waves are good enough to interrogate in the NMR spectroscopic technique. And we have already understood that these radiations are not at all harmful, which is why people end up doing MRI a little more happily than that of uh, X-rays or CT scan. And of course, it's a little more expensive, but overall it's much more safer for your health. So what we end up getting here is that the main thing that we are trying to interrogate is energy level differences for a given elect, uh, electronic state. So basically when you apply uh, these radiations, you actually do not change any of the chemical properties of the given molecule. For instance, whenever you, you provide energy, the molecules could start becoming reactive. And once it becomes reactive, it might start changing its characteristics. Thankfully, and, and you would actually see some of these aspects when you're doing spectroscopy, such as fluorescence or even UV visible spectroscopy. On the other hand, since NMR ends up using very, very low energy radiations, the molecule ends up being in its ground electronic state. And therefore, you'll be able to understand what kind of system that you're looking for. Now the, sorry, now the next question that comes up is what elements in the periodic table are NMR active? Would isotopes be NMR active? This is an interesting question. And what people have found is that whenever you have an even, even nucleus in their uh, mass number and atomic number, these are NMR inactive. So they have a zero spin quantum number. On the other hand, if you are having an odd even type of a nucleus, you end up having a n by two spin quantum number. And when you have an uh, odd odd, uh, or a, rather an even odd type of a nucleus, you end up having a spin quantum number that is an integer. For instance, when you're talking about a proton 1H, it actually has a spin of half. On the other hand, the same uh, uh, hydrogen atom which uh, in its other isotope, which is deuterium, has a spin of one. And once again, uh, when you're looking at tritium, it also has a spin of half. So therefore, a given uh, element in the periodic table based on its isotope, could display different NMR active uh, NMR activeness, which we'll see uh, is dependent on a few other parameters in addition to the uh, NMR spin quantum number. So before going there, let me try to give you a little bit of a quick history on uh, where NMR and its idea started. Of course, it's just not NMR. Uh, since NMR is based on spin quantum number, I'm already starting with the electron spin that was proposed back in 1925 by Ulhen Beck and Todd Smith. And in fact, after their proposal, in, uh, even when Pauli and Darwin were able to uh, do some quantum mechanics, they were able to say that a wave function gains its completeness only when you introduce the spin quantum number of the electron. And in fact, these uh, topics, uh, I mean, these ideas were actually tested by Stern and Gerlach back in 1933, where they were actually able to show that the electron does have a spin. Therefore, nuclei also would end up having a similar aspect. In fact, the electrons uh, uh, multiplicity they saw was actually influenced further by the nuclear spin when they did further experiments. And then the first attempt of NMR was done back in 1960, uh, 1936, where, uh, and followed by Rabi, uh, whom you are seeing on the top right here, who was able to show that indeed you can actually get a signal. And it was not until uh, Block, uh, Felix Block and Purcell, uh, who ended up uh, showing that it is indeed feasible to actually get NMR of bulk material. This ended up being uh, providing a paradigmatic shift uh, in thinking that NMR spectroscopy could be applied to a wide range of materials. But they started just with bulk materials, assuming that that's where it's going to be useful. So they were looking at water, paraffin, wax, and molecules of that, I mean, uh, bulk matter of that kind. In fact, it was in 1948 to 50 uh, where uh, there's a parameter called chemical shift which people started to uh, attribute towards an important aspect of NMR, which could be helpful for many different purposes. And I'd like to highlight here of many scientists who worked in this. It was in fact, one of the Indian scientists who also contributed quite a bit in this by name Srinivas Zarmati. And 1952, uh, uh, Block and Purcell were awarded the Nobel Prize for showing NMR of bulk material. And in 1957, uh, instead of just looking at the proton, actually even carbon-13 nucleus, uh, was also even probed in order to get the first uh, carbon-13 NMR spectrum. I'm sure people who do NMR actively every day 
uh, whenever they submit their uh, molecule for characterization, they get proton and carbon NMR, and that dates uh, much more than 50 years from today. Uh, 1961 was the first time where Varian Brothers came up with the first commercial 60 megahertz NMR instrument. Currently, uh, there are two major companies that uh, end up providing NMR, Brooker and uh, Joel, but uh, about uh, five, six years back, Varian uh, was also a very important player in making NMR instruments who uh, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, the first ever, uh, the next major shift in NMR came up when instead of doing in a continuous wave mode, a Fourier transform mode was actually introduced by Professor Richard Ernst. Um, this ended up, so you see Richard Ernst uh, at the bottom here. Yeah, so uh, Richard Ernst was able to show that instead of doing a conventional way of spectroscopy, where you sweep across the entire uh, range, instead of doing that, if you do it in a Fourier transform way, where all the energies are simultaneously perturbed, and you record the signal in a time domain fashion and convert it to frequency domain, you would be able to get all the information. And this was extremely important because NMR being an insensitive technique, people were able to do signal averaging much faster in order to improve the signal to noise ratio, which I was referring to a moment earlier. The next biggest breakthrough came up in 1970s, where uh, Richard Ernst and James Giner were able to show not just 1D NMR, people could actually start correlating two different properties of different nuclei in a multidimensional approach and demonstrated 2D NMR for the very first time in 1970s. In fact, uh, one can actually say none of the biomedical uh, or biomolecular NMR studies would be feasible without such 2D and 3D and ND NMR experiments that we end up routinely using. In fact, even before the 2D NMR started to make its way through for biomolecules, it was actually Kurt Utrecht, uh, whom you are seeing here, uh, who was able to show that uh, uh, proton NMR could already be used to understand how biomolecules behave. There's an important aspect that I would like to put out here that until that time, only crystal structures in terms of single crystal XRD or powder XRD was available for people to visualize how proteins and protein side chains go. And in fact, just because of seminal experiments performed by Kurt Utrecht, they were actually able to see protein side chains are actually not static. They end up having a lot of conformational dynamics and this was actually a thought which was resisted a lot in, during those times. So therefore, one can actually say the importance of conformational dynamics was imparted by NMR spectroscopy early, in the early 80s itself. And that was a time when a lot of uh, development was happening. So between the 80s and 90s, people started to look at NMR as an avenue towards solving protein structures. And bovine pancreatic trypsin inhibitor was the first structure that was solved solely using NMR studies. And uh, the contributions given, uh, made by Ernst uh, earned him a Nobel Prize in 91. And this was the time during which, uh, moving on from the 2D NMR spectroscopy, uh, once the pulse field gradients were introduced in 1989, uh, multiple three-dimensional NMR experiments were introduced by Adbax and Louis K, which are extremely useful towards the characterization of biomolecules. And of course, in 2002, Kurt Utrecht shared the Nobel Prize for characterization of biomolecules and his contribution coming from the NMR side. I've just spoken about the spectroscopy aspect of it. There are a lot of other wonderful uh, developments that happened. In the magnetic resonance imaging side of it, which I'm not summarized here, but just to uh, give an idea, in 2003, Paul Lauterberg and Peter Mansfield were awarded the Nobel Prize in uh, physiology for their contributions in MRI. And where has NMR been for the last two decades, uh, right from the time uh, where I started my PhD until now, is that people are applying NMR in order to understand more and more biomolecular systems so that we understand biology better so as to cater towards many biomedical applications. Uh, I'm going to be showing some of the illustrations in this lecture. And uh, all these illustrations are either taken from the James Keeler textbook or the textbook written by the uh, four eminent authors of NMR, uh, by John Kavanagh, Wayne Fairbrother, Art Palmer, um, uh, Mark Franz, and Nicholas Kelton. Uh, James Keeler's textbook actually is available for you online. Uh, if you go end up searching for this resource, you'll be able to realize, oh, sorry, you'll be able to realize that this is indeed available for you for download. Uh, it's available with beautiful PDF rendering and also wonderful figures and very simple way for chemists to start learning. Um, and in fact, uh, James Keeler also has YouTube videos on his on a channel called ANSMAG, uh, standing for uh, Australia-New Zealand uh, Magnetic Resonance Society. 
And if you go there, you'd once again be able to get lectures given by James Killer in addition to the written notes. All right, so let's start getting into what is NMR, the basics of it, and how it gets being applied to biomolecular systems. We all know Earth is a magnet by itself. And what I'm showing you here in this image is that uh, the magnetic lines of force, which are drawn here, that uh, indicates how a unit north pole would end up moving. Of course, that there are subtle definition differences that come up, but let's assume this is the north pole and this is the south pole. And I'm sure all of you have done experiments back in your school that what happens when you suspend a bar magnet in the Earth's magnetic field? Initially, you can orient it across any possible orientation, but if you let it equilibrate over a period of time, it ends up being parallel to the Earth's magnetic field. And this is, in fact, how a magnetic compass works with which people end up navigating themselves in the, uh, uh, in the sea and the ocean, right? So now, what is the difference between a bar magnet and the nuclear magnet that we are talking about? Unlike a bar magnet that can possibly have every possible orientation, the nuclear magnet you will see in a moment cannot have every possible orientation. So that is what is being introduced in the next slide where we are talking about the, magnet, uh, the nuclear magnetic quantum number, spin quantum number i. And I was just mentioning to you, let's take an example that is exploited most often by chemists, which is a 1H isotope of hydrogen, which has a spin quantum number of half. If you have a spin quantum number of half, the allowed states are plus minus half, which is the end quantum number. And without going into further details of quantum mechanics that uh, makes many people a little jittery, I'll try to explain uh, in a simple terms, uh, where you are able to see the magnetic moment, the magnitude of the magnetic moment that's given by I is given by square root of H cross of into I into I plus one. I'm sure this you would have studied in your uh, uh, chemistry textbooks itself, where if you have a spin quantum number of half, you would get, sorry, the H cross should be outside. You're going to get something off of the kind that the magnitude of I is going to be square root of three by two times H cross. So basically what it tries to say is that when you have a main magnetic field, V0, the magnitude that's induced by this uh, vector is going to be square root of three by two. And the, let's, for the sake of simplicity, let's assume that the field is applied along the z-axis. The projection of the field that's given by the iz is going to be given by uh, the m, uh, m values that are allowed for a given uh, quantum number. So basically you're going to have something like plus half h cross, you're also going to have a minus half H cross. So these are the two possible values that are allowed for a nuclear magnet. So meaning that if you're taking a, a spin of one H, you can only have two possible orientations, either something that's close enough, which is called as parallel orientation to B naught, although it's not parallel, it subtends a 54.7 degree with respect to B naught, or the anti-parallel orientation, which also subtends a 54.7 degrees with respect to minus Z. But in general, uh, in literature, people end up calling this the alpha state and the beta state. So I hope I'm able to make the connect right now that spectroscopy is between two energy states that you can actually generate in a given condition. So in the NMR spectroscopy world for spin half system, you're talking about the alpha and the beta states, which are the two energy levels that come up when you subtend it in the external energy uh, magnetic field of B naught. And once you have a population once you have an energy difference that results in a population difference in these two states, once you have a population difference, you can actually apply the electromagnetic radiation, in this case, the radio frequency pulses, in order to change the populations and therefore get the signal from them to understand uh, how the system looks. The important aspect that one has to understand here is the energy that drives the orientation of these nuclear magnets. Without once again going into further detail, the nuclear spin quantum number actually dictates the magnetic dipole moment that is introduced, introduced. And this magnetic dipole moment, once again, dictates the energy of a given state. So as you're able to see, it's a minus mu dot B. So therefore, it's going to be minus magnitude of mu, magnitude of B times cos of the angle between the B and the mu vector. So when you have such a condition, you are able to see when theta is equal to zero is a condition where uh, it might end up uh, having the lowest of energy. So energy minima, will be minus mod mu mod b. Of course, that is not possible for nuclear magnets, largely because there are only two states that are feasible. And that's exactly why, since the alpha state is close enough where the theta uh, is uh, less than 90, you end up having a given energy state. And that's the same reason why the beta ends up having a higher energy state. And, uh, uh, and this is what ends up uh, resulting 
the energy difference that comes up between these two energy uh, states. Now, uh, there is one important aspect that I did not uh, introduce. Let me erase all markings that I've done. So one important aspect that you should focus in in this nuclear magnetic moment is in addition to the uh, spin quantum number i, the other factor that matters a lot is called the gyromagnetic ratio. The gyromagnetic ratio is a constant for a, uh, every given nuclei, which you'll see in the next slide. And as you're able to see, the nuclei is given, the spin quantum number is given, and the gyromagnetic ratio of gamma is given in uh, SI units. And the natural abundance that is being present is also listed here. And what you're able to see for two given different nuclear isotopes of uh, hydrogen, you're able to see the spin quantum number could be different from one another. So is the gamma. This is an important aspect. This results in the fact that when you take a spin one uh, hydrogen atom versus spin half hydrogen isotope, you're going to have different population differences, uh, 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 polarizations and population differences that come up. And the gyromagnetic ratio is also going to end up being different. And this is extremely important for people to understand, largely because you have at least one order of magnitude difference that ends up coming, resulting in the dipole being quite different from one another. In case of 1H, it's going to be close to 10 times. Actually, it's more for other reasons, but uh, just for the sake of it, just due to the gamma, it's, uh, it's going to be about, uh, sorry, not 10 times, about six, uh, let's say seven times more than that of uh, 1H that's going to be present. On the other hand, the next commonly utilized nuclei that is carbon-13, if you pay close attention, you would see that it's about one-fourth of the uh, gyromagnetic ratio of uh, a proton. And the other most exploited nuclei is nitrogen-15, which has about negative magnitude, remember that, and it's about one-tenth of that of a proton. And in addition to the spin quantum number i, the gyromagnetic ratio gamma, the natural abundance also matters and which you are able to see is a wide range. For instance, 1H proton is 99.99% abundant, which is why almost every chemist likes to do that NMR right away. On the other hand, if you take a look at carbon-13, you have only 1% of abundance, which reduces the sensitivity of the technique about 100-fold in comparison to proton in addition to other factors. And therefore, uh, we only do carbon rarely. We, we don't end up getting it for every sample that we end up spent, uh, giving. So now, quickly coming into small molecular influence uh, on how NMR is being completely exploited, is this periodic table that helps you understand different isotopes that are present. So you'll be able to see spin-off isotopes that are in pink, uh, half integer isotopes, that is N by two spins in yellow, and N uh, integer spins in green. Uh, this is a periodic table that I got from GEOL, which is the other manufacturer of NMR instruments. And what you are immediately able to see, irrespective of any element that you would like to probe in the molecule that you have synthesized in your lab, NMR is a technique that is directly feasible. This is one of the very unique aspects of NMR, which makes it a prominent tool for uh, chemists and biochemists to use it. So let me quickly recap what, you, uh, what I have uh, said so far. This is the example of the one edge spin. And this is the example of a two-head spin. Uh, one head spin can have only two possible orientations, the alpha and the beta state, while the spin one system of two heads can have a one, zero, and sorry, uh, plus one, zero, and minus one states that are possible. Once again, which is getting close enough to the parallel and the anti-parallel nature that we see classically. And therefore, as you keep increasing the spin quantum number, more st such states will be feasible. And when the spin quantum number tends to infinity, you're going to have a classical magnet, which is what we end up seeing. The moment, sorry, and the moment you end up interrogating these two energy levels, you'll get a spectrum from which you'll be able to uh, decipher a lot of information. Um, due to the want of time, I'm going to be a little fast. Uh, uh, the population difference that comes up between these two states, alpha and beta, what ends up happening, although you have a small population excess in uh, alpha, you would soon understand, given by the parameters of V0, M, gamma, and H cross, and the temperature and the Boltzmann constant, you will realize that only one in 10 power six excess is found in P alpha, or rather in the alpha state. The P alpha is a slight excess that comes up. Uh, this is an advantage because that's why we are able to use radio waves, which are harmless. But this comes as a disadvantage, making NMR an insensitive technique. Uh, Insensitive meaning that you've got to supply a lot of the molecule in order to even see the spectrum uh, coming up properly. If you take very less concentration, optical techniques such as fluorescence or UV visible will be able to give you a signal 
but NMR might not be able to give it. For instance, if you take a nanomolar of the sample, fluorescence or UV would be able to help you out, while NMR is going to take a long time for you to get the signal. Of course, so th that's one of the disadvantages I spoke to you about. So we were just talking about an example where if you have a B naught, you're going to have two states that are present, the alpha state and the beta state that are present. Of course, this is a single isolated spin that we are talking about. Whenever you end up taking, let's say, one millimolar of uh, solution, you're going to have 10 power 20 molecules. Of course, you're going to have 6 into 10 power 20 molecules that are present. So what ends up happening, instead of sampling alpha and beta half of the time, this ends up giving you a picture, which I'll try to draw right now, where you're going to have alpha spins oriented as a cone. And then, oops, and then the beta spin also oriented as a cone. So this ends up resulting, the P alpha and the P beta that we were talking about, the number of uh, vectors here would be determined by P alpha and P beta. And as I said, since P alpha is slightly more than P beta, what will end up happening is that if you resolve every vector into its mutually orthogonal components of X and Y, let's say this is R and this is theta, you're going to have R cos theta as the projection along the x-axis and R sine theta as the projection along the y-axis. And therefore, if you um, end up resolving each of the vector into its mutually orthogonal components, you'll soon realize that any component that comes in the transverse plane will get canceled out. On the other hand, you're going to have the one that are phasing up, uh, along the z-axis uh, to add up together. And what will end up happening? You're going to have a magnetization that comes up due to the alpha spin. You're going to have a magnetization that comes up to the, the beta spin. Since these are driven by the populations that are present, the length of the m alpha vector is greater than the m beta, which results in a small bulk magnetization, which we end up exploiting in NMR spectroscopy in order to get the information. So let's quickly try to understand how that works. So this is a small magnetization, magnetization that, uh, that you have generated that, you, uh, that I just mentioned a moment back. When you start with, you have a small population excess that I mentioned. Then you apply the R of pulse. Let's assume that you are applying an R of pulse, which results in a 90 degree rotation. So meaning that if you are applying across the Y axis, what ends up happening is that the magnetization tilts into the X axis. And then once the magnetization fills here, you have a coil which picks up the signal and the signal ends up being the time domain, which when we put your transform would give you the necessary details. So I'm not going to go into the details of how this ends up happening. I encourage students to strongly look for the simulations and also wonderful lectures given by uh, Dr. P.T. Callahan uh, that are available in YouTube with many, many demonstrations to understand how this ends up coming. Uh, I'm just quickly going to jump into how the signal looks and how the magnetization ends up ch changing. I'm sure all of you are aware of chemical kinetics, where when you start a reaction, you have a certain amount of concentration. And over a period, the concentration of the, the reactants reduce and the concentration of products increase. And same thing happens here. You started with the magnetization that points along the z-axis. After you have tilted it to the x-axis, the rate of change of magnetization is given in the first order as shown here. This is similar to what you might have learned. BA by DT is equal to minus K times A, which is the first order uh, kinetic equation. The same thing you're looking at here. So what uh, Block ended up showing is that he said, okay, let's assume there is a first order decay of magnetization that's generated along the XY plane. So we end up uh, uh, establishing equations like this, which when you integrate, you get something like this. This is the same equation that I'm sure you would remember from the uh, kinetics uh, that you might have studied in your class, uh, chemical kinetics. So the same equation that you have here. Uh, interestingly, the rate of recovery of the longitudinal magnetization is different that, that, than that of the transverse uh, magnetization. Once again, I don't have the time to go into the details of it. It suffices to say that the transverse magnetization has a higher relaxation rate, most often in solution in MR, than the transverse relaxation rate. So therefore, the signals are given in this form, where, as I said, this is the signal that you obtain in the time domain, which when you Fourier transform using the mathematical expression that is shown here, of course, this is for continuous uh, functions. When you're trying to use discretized signal, which is what we obtain in MMR, you do something called discrete Fourier transformation using different algorithms, which will help you get the spectrum. 
And the spectrum, as I said, has many information where the line width will be given by the R2 by pi. The area under the curve decides what is the intensity. Of course, the line width and intensity uh, would be dictated by the total area under the curve. The resonance frequency is, is what is given by the offset here, or rather the omega here, would uh, help you understand what is the chemical shift that you're trying to observe. So this uh, slide basically summarizes the, all of that. Since I'm running out of time, I'm going to be a little quick here. So once you are able to measure the frequency, you refer it with a given uh, a reference sample, internal reference, which generally we use as uh, tetrametal silane for organic molecules. Uh, and then when you refer it to the total magnetic field, uh, omega naught here is given by minus gamma B naught, where gamma is the gyromagnetic ratio and B naught is the magnetic field strength, you get this parameter called chemical shift. And this is, called, this is uh, given in parts per million is a unit that is given to it, largely because when you take this ratio, you'll have a 10 power minus six that is offset by the 10 power six that you have here. So let, let's take a simple example of the water molecule, which has two identical protons that are present. When you take water molecule and then substitute it with the deuterium to understand how many chemically different protons are present, you would realize that both these protons are indeed one and the same, meaning that you substitute either one of this, these two chemical species are same. So basically water ends up giving you a single NMR signal. Same would be the case of the methane molecule. But let's just complicate our life by combining these two where you have methanol that is present. So when you have methanol, I'm sure you're able to realize a hydroxyl proton and the three of the methyl protons are different from one another. On the other hand, each of the methyl proton is identical to one another because if you make a substitution in either one of this, the chemical that ends up coming up is the same. So therefore, what people were able to see when they do NMR of methanol, they were able to see two different signatures that end up coming. And this was extremely important in appreciating NMR as a spectroscopic technique, largely because slowly people started to understand the amount of electron cloud that is being present in the oxygen influences the chemical shift that's observed for the hydroxyl proton. And the same case is for the methyl protons where uh, the electron cloud is largely pushed towards the oxygen due to the indef inductive effect and also the electronegative effect of the oxygen. So people started to understand if you have different uh, uh, protons that are present, chemically different protons that are present, NMR would be the technique to go with. Let, let's quickly complicate the molecule with one level up, which is ethanol, where you have CH3, CH2OH. And immediately you are able to count one, two, three signals that end up coming. And these three signals end up coming largely because you have one hydroxyl proton, one uh, type of met methylene proton, and one type of methyl proton. Of course, in addition to all this, what you will end up seeing is that if you integrate all of this, the integration would also go based on the number of protons that are present within each of these molecules. So you will get something like one, two, and three, which also makes NMR an extremely powerful tool in order to have a semi-quantitation within a given molecule that is being present. And if you pay close attention, what you're able to see here is that the methyl proton comes as a triplet, while the methylene proton comes as something called a quartet. These are all manifestations of something called scalar coupling, which tries to say how many neighbors are indeed present in next to each one of this uh, proton that we are interrogating. For instance, the methyl proton has two neighbors that is present. So applying the two Ni plus one, where N is the number of neighbors that's present and their spin quantum number. So you will two times half, sorry, two times two times half plus one. You'll get a number, which is three, which is what is the triplet. So this is called a triplet that comes up. And then similarly, when you're tra trying to look at the methylene proton, it has three neighbors. So you do the same math, two times three times half plus one, will give you four. So that is what makes it a quartet. So people were immediately able to understand in addition to chemical shift, you have something called integration that gives you semi quantitation And you also have scalar coupling that helps you understand what kind of neighbors are present. Uh, now that we have to immediately go towards larger molecules, I'm going to uh, go a little faster from here on to completion within the next five to six minutes. And if you go forward to understand how NMR has been implemented and uh, uh, applied uh, for uh, biomolecules, this is one example of a protein. This is the BPTI protein that I was talking about. And just to give a quick overview of what are proteins, proteins are made of monomers called amino acids. 
there are 20 different types of amino acids which are linked together covalently in order to form a polypeptide and this polypeptide could fold into different types of tertiary structures such as alpha helices and beta sheets and in order to characterize the structure we have to use different techniques such as xrd or nmr and the moment you get the structure it's very important because if this molecule is indeed involved in, let's say disease then one could try to come up with drugs in order to tackle it i came from uh, came to know from professor kalpana that you had a, a discussion on drug discovery and how to take it to the market a few days back so i'm sure you understand in such a uh, science you need to have an idea of the structure of a molecule which nmr would be able to provide there are a few important things that one is able to understand unlike the ethanol molecule where the resonances were simple i'm sure you are able to understand the number of resonances that you see in a biomolecule increases tremendously as we go forward we will try to see how this can be alleviated but assuming that you are able to get information of the carbon 13 and the proton chemical shifts you are able to quickly understand that the 20 different amino acids can be easily characterized by nmr of course by doing multi dimensional nmr techniques so the moment you are able to do this you will be able to precisely say although you have multiple alanines that are present in a protein you will be precisely able to say which alanine is interacting let's say with the drug that you are providing and of course we have already spoken about scalar coupling due to the want of time i'm going to be skipping it uh, uh, except for telling one simple point uh, what was actually observed by martin parplus who also won the nobel prize in uh, 2013 is that when you are able to pick up scalar coupling between two uh, sorry two dipoles that are present uh, the magnitude of the scalar coupling also is dependent on the torsion angle basically the dihedral angle subtended between the four atoms that connects these two uh, spins and uh, just as an example that is given here there are different motifs that are present in proteins like a right handed alpha helix which is the most common left handed alpha helix and beta sheet and using the magnitude that one ends up getting one will be able to say that once you measure what kind of a protein that you are working with this is yet another example and this is taken from yet another beautiful book uh, by rules and hitchens please take a look at it so now i'm getting to the conclusion of uh, the whole uh, seminar where i said okay nmr is super helpful but when once you go to the proteins life is complicated why is life complicated the width that ends up coming in every resonance is dictated by the transverse relaxation rate which i briefly introduced to you and this transverse relaxation rate is in turn related to the overall tumbling time of a given molecule that depends on the size of the molecule the viscosity of the solution and then the temperature at which you are doing an experiment so as you start doing larger and larger sized molecules the r2 increases the line width increases therefore you're going to get broader and broader resonances the problem of broader resonances is that the intensity reduces with respect to noise so therefore your signal to noise ratio comes down so and also remember as you start going for more and more uh, bigger molecules the number of resonances overlap will also increase so in order to uh, alleviate this uh, this is the example that we saw for a uh, sucrose kind of molecule which is 300 dalton once you go to a protein something of the bpti range you have many many resonances and number of resonances increase line with also increases oops and this is an important aspect so although dynamics plays an important role what one would be able to see in addition one would also be able to characterize the conformation dynamics of different spins that are present uh, without going into uh, much detail due to the want of time what one is able to understand depending upon whether the b methyl protons are close to the proton are close to the oxygen you are going to end up getting two different resonances that can actually be probed this is one of the earliest examples where nmr was shown to have the power to actually study conformational dynamics and nowadays people end up using it in the protein world to actually see molecules that are otherwise not visible so now coming back okay now that the li lines are getting broader what people started to do is to do multi dimension nmr but in addition in addition to the protein dimension you also get the carbon resolution so that the number of protons that are present are resolved by other nuclei that are present in a given molecule once again these are very interesting aspects that one should take a look at just to give an idea when you are having a dna you have 80 watson and crick base pair that is present and you flip one of the bases to form something called a hookstein base pair using two dimensional nmr spectroscopy the resonance that is present here ends up moving so much so even a small change in a dna double helix could actually be studied using nmr spectroscopy and in addition i'm sure uh, people would have uh, not just uh, studying biomolecules one could also use it for metabolomic applications where a sample that could be taken across healthy patient healthy controls versus 
disease patient would help towards diagnosis of diseases. Um, and this has been extremely useful in many different diseases. And many, many people in India are actually practicing this with NMR. Uh, once again, due to want of time, I'm going to be skipping this. Overall, I, I would I'm getting to the last slide right now. Just to give an idea, when you're having a very, very large size protein, there are different tools that people have come up with where they end up doing deuteration of different carbons in order to get sizes as close to 800 uh, kilo dalton. These are very, very large protein systems. So I hope I have emphasized the fact that you can start using NMR and what is the basis of NMR and you can use it from very, very small molecules to very large molecules. And uh, just last two minutes will be on what research I have done and very, very quickly. And I started my research as a master's student in Professor Chandra Kumar's lab, where I actually looked at uh, Mosambi. So what I did was to actually take the, uh, uh, the street line, do an MRI image, pick a small portion of it and do NMR of it. Then you might be curious, why did I do something like this? The whole idea of doing this was that fruits after having been harvested also ripe when they are being sold. We wanted to understand how the ripening of fruits changes as a function of time after the uh, fruit has been harvested. We were able to see artificial ripening actually has its own problems. On the other hand, natural ripening uh, helps in having the longevity of the fruit. And in my uh, PhD research, I looked at how aromatic rings within a given protein ends up behaving and also solving structures of uh, different biomolecules, including the four helical bundle I'm showing. My major interest has been in developing NMR methods in order to get multidimension NMR experiments done uh, in a much, much faster fashion. Since due to the want of time, all I can say is that uh, multidimension NMR experiment takes several hours. Uh, but what I was able to do in my PhD and postdoc is to get it into few seconds, even uh, within, uh, for a very, very small concentration of molecule within several hours. And currently my lab focuses on understanding DNA and how the DNA uh, ends up uh, being plastic based on different modifications that are present. In my postdoc lab, I was able to see when a DNA is damaged, it ends up calling a protein. Uh, the structure changes in a way such that it calls for a protein in order to repair it. And currently what we are looking at are epigenetic modifications. Uh, these are modifications that come up in your uh, genome based on your lifestyle and the environment that you're present in. And now we are trying to understand how that modulates uh, uh, given uh, uh, DNA. And in, in addition to looking at uh, duplex DNA, we are also looking at quadruplex system. And using chemical shifts, we are able to come up with a technique where we can actually characterize even more complicated biomolecular systems just by using proton 1D and 2D NMR spectrum as shown here. Uh, so this is where my research is. And if you are very interested to uh, know more, please feel free to email me. Take a look at my lab web page. And before I finish, uh, I thank everybody for the attention and most importantly, uh, uh, your college for calling me and giving me a wonderful opportunity to present my research to all of you. And what you're able to see here, uh, uh, this is one of the older pictures that was taken about three years back. Uh, the group consists of PhD students and master's students who end up doing their project. And this is Rajveer who helps us a lot in the NMR uh, uh, facility maintenance. And you see the wonderful 700 megahertz that we have that we end up using all the time. And this is a more recent picture that was taken in February 2020. I'm sure you see a lot of people have changed over a period of time um, because the master students come and go all the time. And feel free to email me if you have any further questions. I'll be more than happy to explain things to you. I also have created a bunch of lectures uh, that go into very final details of what is NMR and how it works. Of course, that requires some fundamentals in quantum chemistry and spectroscopy, but I would appreciate if you guys would be interested to go take a look at this and give me your comments. And if you have any further questions, you can email me anytime. And with that, I stop my presentation and I'm more than happy to take any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I would just request students, do you have any questions? Students, do you have any questions? If you have any questions, you can ask. Um, I request students to feel free to ask questions, either type in the box or if you're very shy, you can always email me, but feel free to unmute and speak up. Uh, the whole point of a session like this is to make sure people understand. So feel free to ask questions. Flipping, Doctor, from Dr. Dharmendra Kumar Satnami to everyone, he's asking what yeah. is flipping? Very, very good question. So let me try to show 
flipping in in its own sense has been uh, uh, the major stay of my life throughout uh, right from my uh, phd days uh, and i've been fortunate enough to work with ring flips as well so what is ring flipping uh, let's take a simple example that might relate to chemists uh, let's take an example of biphenyl oh actually let's not even go to biphenyl let's take methane to start i mean ethane to start with so uh, here what you are able to see is that you have a single bond that is capable of rotation and due to the uh, fact that the energy barrier for the uh, syn and i mean the uh, gauche and anti being a little less these conformers are always sampled in solution on the other hand when you are having aromatic rings what ends up happening is that you still have the single bond but due to protons that are present close to each other due to steric and other electronic effects the activation barrier for the single bond rotation increases and of course the biphenyl still ends up uh, the single bond ends up being uh, rotating quite fast but uh, let's take other examples let's take uh, uh, triaryl methanes for instance so uh, let's say you have something like ph ph h and ph so when you have triaryl methanes what ends up happening uh, just because of the fact that the rings are present quite close to each other in a closely packed tetrahedron space the rings cannot happily rotate by the single bond that is actually present for them okay so in the case that they are able to flip what will end up happening the positions uh, let me actually go back to the example that was also shown here earlier so this is not a ring flip but this is like conformation of dynamics that we are talking about ring flip is very similar let me try to draw it so that it makes sense what has happened is that the methyl b group which was previously present close to the proton has actually gone close to the uh, oxygen that is present so in the core of a protein when you have uh, so let's say this goes to a protein which has a complex three dimensional structure around it uh, let me try to draw this completely what will end up happening across this axis the ring would rotate when the ring rotates what ends up happening is that these two protons end up exchanging positions and it what has been found by kurt utrecht back in 1980s this was a very very important experiment to make people understand there are actually rings that are present in the core of the protein let me try to show you a protein uh, which i had a structure of a uh, little array there you go when you have pro, uh, aromatic ring that's present inside the uh, core of the protein although you might imagine that there are other atoms that are present very very close to it these rings end up flipping you can think about it at last like taking a roti and flipping it on the pan or even when somebody does a dosa after you have it for some time you flip the dosa so basically the ring ends up flipping uh, ends up experiencing flips in the uh, center uh, in, in the middle in the core of the protein so nmr is capable of such uh, studying such ring flips and in fact these ring flips are less common in small molecules they are present in something called atrop isomers which also we are studying currently in my lab uh, but more common in biomolecular systems and that's a similar example that i gave for the watson and crick to hookstein transition let me try to quickly show you so if you are taking a look at this what has happened um sorry so what has happened is that a given chi angle a given dihedral angle once when it switches from anti to syn the entire ring ended up flipping and still forms hydrogen bond that that's a different consequence and what you are able to see the aromatic ring ends up flipping and this happens in all the molecules by biomolecules as we speak uh, and this is something that's been extremely crucial for biomolecular function is what people are also thinking right now the breathing motions that come when such a thing happens is extremely crucial for its function so so yeah so uh, that is some that's what i refer to as ring flipping i hope that was uh, clear enough for you please let me know dr darmi okay so i hope it's clear uh, next any question by any student somebody wants to ask the question or not okay okay i hope uh, everything is clear to them sir so in case there are questions
questions uh, i'll let you know uh, through your mail and uh, you already sure. have shared your mail with the students i'll right. also let all the students know about your mail in case yeah. there is anything we can let you know and as hamare yeah. principal uh, sahab ne shuru mein hi kaha tha we would want bhopal is not very far away that right. when all, everything becomes normal please you are most welcome to this sure. college please come and visit this college now i invite sure. uh, principal of the college dr bhardwaj for uh, the concluding remarks welcome sir be, be, sir is very before, busy he has before, to leave for uh, some... i see ji ji sir i see yeah i see just yeah, just one yeah, point i i i i see okay uh, i encourage all uh, students to apply for phd positions in isar bhopal so uh, do take a look at our website there are a lot of people so let me stop right there and uh, let dr bhardwaj take over yes sir welcome sir principal sir please uh, go ahead thank you ma'am uh, thank you dr bharadwaj it was really very uh, very good experience as far as the nmr uh, is concerned because it's otherwise it's a very difficult concept to understand people uh, when they start st studying nmr of ethanol sometimes they get confused and they just when we reach to the hyperfine spectra of uh, spectrum of ethanol they even cannot understand how the uh, what it is is split again and uh, why this hydrogen is not leaving its place and uh, there the things start uh, becoming difficult and uh, the concept of nmr as now it is uh, it's in the key position in uh, biomedical research now i must say that all the things uh, are revolving around uh, magnetic images and uh, mri and everything related to uh, magnetic uh, property of a a nucleus and uh, this is real this is really if you can work in this area if you can understand this if you can work to solve problems related to uh, human kind then you are really working a, you are working for the society not for the sake of knowledge rather you are working for the uh, betterment of the society so it's really it was really a very nice good experience to listen uh, about an mr from you and uh, as you said that our students must uh, approach to uh, iser for research programs i must rather i must say that if uh, they can ever come to see even that how how it works how it how isers are working in the country and what are the facilities available over there because uh, as kal pressing may also know that in a project uh, which is uh, sponsored by world bank we have demanded one nmr spec स्कोप इन कॉलेज बट अभी वो तो शायद दूर की कौड़ी है पता नहीं कब वो होगा बट दैट इज व्हाट वी ड्रीम सो इट्स रियली इट इट वाज रियली ग्रेट एक्सपीरियंस टू लिसन सच अ डिफिकल्ट थिंग द कांसेप्ट ऑफ एन एम आर इन सच अ ब्रीफ मैनर एंड इन सच अ स्वीट मैनर यू शुड ऑलमोस्ट एवरीथिंग यू शुड प्रोटीन मॉलिक्यूल्स देयर एन एम आर स्पेक्ट्रम एंड हाउ आर how they are obtained and amino acid sequencing and how is that ident identified so it was really a very nice time to uh, listen uh, from you so i thank you again and professor pare is there head of the department chemistry dr jivan sis solanki is there and all the participants who have spared their time for this uh, great event i thank you all uh, thank you very much dr kalpana singh uh, thank you once again uh we have with us uh, dr jivan singh solanki uh, head of the department uh, coordinator of pharmaceutical chemistry with us uh, dr solanki i am just uh, stealing on your time and i just request you to please say few words uh, to thank our guest आपको भी मुझे पता है इसके इमीजिएटली बाद किसी और वर्कशॉप पे जाना है लेकिन फिर भी मैं आप ही से रिक्वेस्ट करूंगी कि प्लीज से फ्यू वर्ड्स टू थैंक आर एस्टीम गेस्ट विच विच इज डॉक्टर भरद्वाज वॉज विद अस ऑन एन एम आर डॉक्टर जीवन सिंह सोलंकी बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद सिंह मैडम आज इस बहु आयामी व्याख्यान व्याख्यान जो दिया वो निश्चित रूप से हमारे सभी स्टूडेंट के लिए बहुत लाभकारी हो गए इस महत्वपूर्ण व्याख्यान के लिए मैं आपका तह दिल से माधव विज्ञान महाविद्यालय और आंतरिक गुणवत्ता प्रकोष्ठ माधव साइंस कॉलेज की तरफ से बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद ज्ञापित करता हूँ थैंक यू थैंक यू वन सेकेंड Thank you very much for calling. Sorry if I've gone longer. I'm sorry about that. No, no, definitely not, sir. Wait for a minute. Now I would request all the participants with our with our with us. Please switch on your video for a minute so that I can just take a picture, a screenshot for the record. Please switch on your video for a minute if it is possible. Thank you very much.
thank you very much i can see so so many uh, good people here thank you very much thank you ma'am thanks a lot thank you sir thank you for being with us aaj main janti hu ki dr satyamurthy bharadwaj was a examiner phd examiner somewhere and i have humne unka bhi time ek type se steal hi kiya was very busy but if you have requested any Uh, thank you, sir. I'm more than happy thank to participate. Uh, please let me know if there's something I can do for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep coming, thank sir. You, sir. Keep coming. Sure, I shall. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Feedback link is shared for the participants. Participants, please please log into the feedback link and provide your feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Solanki, for my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we can leave the meeting. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Administrator, now now you can switch off the meeting. Thank you.